no, I don't think you should waste your time discussing petty, petty things. Think of what this alliance wants to achieve and focus on that problem. What do they want to achieve? And you want to achieve an agreement between very many parties, between some civil society groups, and everybody else, on how they will work in the next election. Now that's the most important issue. Personally, what name we call ourselves is neither here nor there. Emilio Stanley Mwai Kibaki, the gentleman of Kenyan politics, described by admirers as a great statesman, a shrewd politician and an astute economist, and credited with key decisions that helped shape the foundations of the Kenyan nation state. Any good things that need to be said about a person should be said about Kibaki. He was just a remarkable person, a person who got along with everybody, irrespective of the station in life. I had, was privileged to work with a real gentleman. Kibaki would never entertain Fitina. No, 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 no. So he, he gave you work to do, he expected you to do the work. I remember him as a leader who was committed to doing the best he could for Kenyans, a person who was professional in the way he conducted business and government, a great debater in parliament, a great contributor, and the Hansard would bear me right. Time magazine, as early as when he was just an assistant minister, Times Magazine say that Kibaki will be the future leader of Kenya. And he was very young. He was in his early 30s. An unlikely hero, Kibaki rose from a small village called Gatuyain in present-day Nyeri County to become one of Kenya's most consequential leaders. What we need as Kenyans, and the action we want to see, is government showing that it is serious, that it means to actually root out corruption. And there will be no way of rooting out corruption until you can have an anti-corruption authority which is able to prosecute people without reference to the Attorney General. In other words, without reference to clearance by government. In a political career spanning well over half a century, Kibaki is credited for his part in penning the famous Sessional Paper No. 10 of 1965 to put in motion the social and economic evolution of a then young nation, a document that would guide Kenya's economic philosophy for decades. It was one of the uh, uh, promulgators, if you like, of the Sessional Paper No. 10 of 1965 in his capacity as economist along with the late Tom Boy at that time which was a very important document in terms of giving uh, a philosophical uh, approach to developing this country. African socialism and its application in the development of Kenya. That was the first document to define where Kenya was going. He actually wrote it himself. But of course, it's today known as a book written by Tom Boyer. Tom Boyer, in fact, commissioned it because when Kibaki went to commerce and industry, uh, who, uh, Jomo Kenyatta created, President Kenyatta created a ministry of planning and national development. It was split from the treasury. And the first minister for that mini ministry was Tom Boyer. So Tom Boyer inaugurated that book. Mwai Kibaki is one of the people who founded um, the foundation or the stability that 
we did right on up to now because uh, they came up with a, a very good bl blueprint of mixed economy, not revolutionary, but pragmatic economic blueprint, uh, which brought in investors, which allowed uh, private sector uh, development in the country, and which really empowered the business in this country. Before assuming power in 2002, Mwai Kibaki had served in the government of the founding president, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta, navigating the delicate Kenyatta succession battles to serve in second president, Daniel Arap Moy's administration, largely as a finance minister and vice president, before going into opposition at the onset of multipartism in 1991. Kibaki was, I think, forced into the opposition by the by circumstances. Um, I think at that time, you know, the, the style of governance changed quite a lot after the, the attempted coup of 1982. That changed the, the, the style of governance because the then president, um, was more focusing on uh, security of the state rather than probably tapping the best brains available. So loyalty became the number one thing. And if anybody expressed a different opinion, there was a lot of sensitivity, a lot of sensitivity, which caused sometimes misinterpretation. And Kibaki started finding his room of operation quite, um, quite narrowed. The space, you know, as Minister of Finance, a, a Vice President, you need to have a broad space. But because of that sensitivity, the, the space of operation became quite narrow. I found in him a very eloquent debater. He was Vice President then and he was uh, the leader of government business in the house. We used to then have serious debaters in the house. Uh, and, and President Kibaki one time famously said that even rigging <laughs> requires some intelligence. That was because of the Mlolongo system, which tried to dislodge him as MP for Dhaya. Uh, it could not work. I came into parliament in December 19. 92 in the Democratic Party which he led and I was in the opposition benches with him as my leader for 10 years until 2002 when we went to government and he appointed me Minister of Water, later Minister for Justice until I resigned on principle in April 2009 and uh, to that extent my political career is very much tied to his and I can say I'm one of those people who learned at his feet to always do your best for your country. In the run-up to the 2002 general election, at the tail end of the Moi era, Raila Odinga, who had teamed up with Kanu earlier in the year, would lead a host of cabinet ministers out of the grand old party to join up with the budding opposition alliance, then led by Kibaki. The Raila faction had by now formed itself into a political party, the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP. Leading to the formation of the National Rainbow Coalition, NAC, a political juggernaut that would energize the masses and drastically alter the trajectory of Kenyan politics.
But what we are called upon is to forgive and say what happened did happen, but from this day on, we want to build that new Kenya. But as Kibaki stood on the cusp of history, the unthinkable happened. A near fatal accident at the Machakos Junction as Kibaki returned to the city from a campaign rally in Ukambani. I got a call from one of the aides of Moe Kibaki, uh, one of his officers, uh, Mr. Derito, telling me they have had an accident uh, in Machakos. It was about six, going to seven. And all I asked him is, uh, is it a bad accident? He says, well, not too bad, but can we meet at the hospital? So we, we stopped whatever we were doing. I drove to the hospital and waited there and it was getting dusk, dark by the time the team arrived. And uh, we got him out of the ambulance and uh, went to the emergency room. And then that's how, we, that's when you do, did our x-rays and scans, that's the time we realized how badly injured he was. You know, with a fracture of the, of the leg, fracture of the arm, uh, fish, uh, f uh, injuries to the neck and other areas. And uh, here was a man who all of us were looking forward to as the hope and the savior of this country in the year 2002. And now, this accident. Kibaki got involved in an accident. Others opportunities took advantage of that position. We never held it against Kibaki. With the country primed for change and the remaining NAC principles firing up the crowds even in Kibaki's absence, the die was cast for Kanu that had held a firm grip on the nation for nearly 40 years. Kibaki, still confined to a wheelchair, romped home with a landslide bringing Kanu's dominance to a screeching halt. Mimi Mwai Kibaki na hapa kwamba nitakuwa mwaminifu wa Jamhuri ya Kenya. He told me why don't you become the chairman of my campaign? And I became the chairman of his campaign. And I'm, um, I am proud of having uh, chaired his campaign and him having succeeded in the cleanest and most fair and, <laughs> and uh, fair election that Kenya has ever had, 2000. Now, all that, then when he won, of course, he called me to go and become his private secretary. I, I had the media at my at my my office, I I, I, he, I had they were waiting for me. Uh, they would like to talk to me. I asked about what. Then they said, "You have been uh, appointed head of public service." I said, "What? By who? I mean, I have not heard. How can I <laughs> believe what you are talking about? So I can't talk about it." Then uh, Fortune 300 TV in the office. When I switched it on. I found, yes, they had been, had been appointed end of public service. So it was all surprise. Uh, then, of course, once that comes, what do you do? Just go to, to the appointing authority. I called the, the control of State House. It would be, yes, come. And uh, we, 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 you see the president. So I went to see the president. At that time, you know, he was, he was, um, he, he, you know, he was recovering from his uh, his accident. Actually, he was in, in his private, you know, private um, rooms, at uh, the house, in the apartment, in the state house. So that's where I met him, and uh, he congratulated me for the appointment. And uh, then I I said. Uh, your Excellency, um, how do you, how often do you want, how many times do you have, want us to have cabinet meetings? One month? I, I said one month. He said no. Fortnightly. <laughs> Fortnightly. And I can assure you, 
During his time for the 10 years, I worked for nine and a half years. We had cabinet meetings every fortnight. A brave new world was dawning on Kenya, a world of possibilities. During the campaigns to remove Kanu, we were, I was with Raila in LDP and Kibaki was in another outfit with uh, Cherry Tingilu and uh, Kijana Wamalwa. When we got together to work together, we formed what we called a summit which really worked, brought together and did. It was the supreme body. And I became the chairman of that summit. So we worked together until we succeeded in getting uh, Kibaki as president. I must say I was ready to run actually as president in 202. And I noticed my friend Raila was not ready. So the battle within the Rainbow Group, LDP, which brought together Raila, myself, Moody Awori, the late Professor George Saitoti, uh, that group inspired the Kenyan uh, political scene to the extent that you can now talk of the NAC revolution. Because then we, we joined with Kibaki's team of Ngilu and uh, and Wamalo in NAK, the whole thing changed. And uh, as a result of that uh, revolution, Kenyans were and judged the most optimistic people on earth. I remember that. Uh, because Kenyans could even uh, arrest a, a policeman and take, take him to a police station, or get some fellow trying to bribe a policeman and get him and take him to a police station. That was a sense of freedom, the sense of fresh beginning. It was a fantastic relationship. You see, I was older than him, and yet he was my boss. But he didn't forget that fact, that I was his elder, brother. So our, our chemistry worked. Both of us are calm people. He's a very patient person. His brain is sharp. Mine, not sharp. So that his sharpness and my not sharpness worked in a symbiotic manner. We relied on each other. Behind the energy in government was a document whose contents would soon spell trouble for Kibaki's young administration. A memorandum of understanding between Kibaki's initial alliance and the Rai Laudinga wing of government. We had a great document uh, called the MOU and under its terms, um, President Kibaki was to be the president. I remember he negotiated hard on Wamalwa because we said if NAK, we are giving you NAK, um, the president, then give LDP the vice president. But Mr. Kibaki convinced us that he had gone so far with Wamalwa. And in any event, we were proposing two vice presidents. So let me go with Wamalwa and you, Kalonzo, will come in as vice president. Raila will come in as Prime Minister, and we had even uh, Professor Saitoti as the first Deputy Prime Minister, um, and then Ngilu was supposed to be the second Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, Kipruto Arapkirwa, I hope you remember him, was supposed to be the third Deputy Prime Minister, and Mze Moody, Uncle Moody, was to be the Chief Coordinating Minister. That was the MOU. He gave me the ministerial position in the Ministry of Home Affairs. Kijana Wamalua was appointed the vice president. Unfortunately, within the next six months, he got ill and he passed away. 
One morning, I was working in my office, and I got a call. You are required at State House. So I went to State House, and I was ushered in, and in his sure, humorous way, he say, Apa iko kazi. Apa iko kazi. Weo naweza kujifanya hii kazi. So I said, kazi gani? Wewe unajua? <laughs> Wewe unajua tu iko kazi gani? So I said, whatever kazi unataka kunipatia, Mimi niko tiari. So we laughed and he said, of course, you know, we are still mourning my friend Kijana Wamalwa, but the government must continue. So I think you can help me in running this government. Are you ready? So I said, Yes. Thank you, I'm ready. That's how, that's how it went. When we went into government, I, there were people who thought I should not be appointed minister because I had rejected a shadow minister position previously. And uh, he brushed them aside and still recognized my contribution and efforts. So he had his own mind. You cannot say that during Mike Bakke's time that he either didn't give you a post or gave you a post because somebody loved it. He always made his decisions. And that's a lesson to those in politics. You have been given your parameters for work. So it's for you to show the output. It's for you to show the output. So he give you a lot of discretion. He, once he has appointed you to a position, he doesn't want you to go running back to him. He was a great person, great deleg who delegates. And so when he delegated, the position of home affairs to me and vice presidency. That was it. He said, Kwenda Ufanya Kazi. But disquiet that was beginning to simmer in the background soon exploded into a full-blown combat in government. During the campaign in 2002, we had stated ambitiously that when we, took, when we take over, we will implement a new constitution in a hundred days. That is the usual political. And indeed, we believed we could do that. But of course, when we took over, there were a lot of things, you know, that could not allow us to do that. We started, unfortunately, and that is like everyone else, Kibaki was no angel, but he was the best person there was at the time and even of now. There were one or two things that did happen. And what that was, there was the men, memorandum of understanding that we had written before. It was not implemented. And that created now a question of, in, you know, intra fighting that delayed the matter of the new constitution. In my view, had the MOU been implemented, President Kebaki would not have faced would not have faced any opposition for his second term. 
And you can imagine how far this country would have gone. There would have been no ICC cases, there would have been nothing. So I think that was a moment where the leadership, all of us failed the country. Kibaki did not break it. It is alleged that he broke that MOU. He didn't do it. Kibaki merely implemented the MOU by appointing the number of ministers which um, they had agreed each party will have. Eleven on one side and fourteen on the other side. Kibaki appointed Raira to the most powerful minister, Minister for Roads, Works, Transport. And Raira was very happy. And he came to say thank you. But, and Kibaki appointed the ministers from both sides, and all the communities were represented as agreed. You know, because Raira and become was very at the center of the politics at that time. You remember, is one who said, you know, Kibaki Tosha. He, he had given a list of the people to be appointed ministers. And of course, Kibaki's side and is the only list. So when the, eventually the selection was done, the, some of the ministers which Raira wanted were left out. Others, just from the same area, others from the same area were selected. And that was the, the main cause. Know that Raira got less than uh, he wanted, but the names of the ministers were not 100% the same. Some were left out, other people were appointed, but from the same, the same area. The failed referendum of 205, that is where the fissures appeared. That is where that campaign, moving on to 207, ended up to be very divisive, and there was ethnic emotions whipped which contributed to, to the 2007, and blame goes to both sides. Because those in government, those of us in government, we look back and we wonder whether we could have done better. Our colleagues who were then in opposition, are there things they could have done better? Because it takes two to tango. I think that's the sad part of our history, which we must never repeat. <laughs> At the Bombers of Kenya, the National Constitution Conference had picked up pace. The new president having promised to deliver on a new constitution within a hundred days. But in Kibaki's inner circle, priorities had changed and the power sharing arrangement that Raila's team had in mind was no longer on the cards. There were forces outside uh, because now, having not implemented the memorandum of understanding, that had injected some negativity in between. So, Yash Palga, uh, uh, he, he had to be thrown out. Then we went with uh, Amos Wako. So there was the, uh, the Wako draft, which to me, I believed, was the right one. But now, at the time, there was, were already the divisions because of the MOU non-implementation. So what Kibaki and I as his lieutenant believed in, the other side did not. That's why in 205, we were unable to go, there was the orange and the banana. His first government, he was very deliberate. 
in who he put where. And that enabled the government to work in harmony. It also enabled the government to deliver results to Kenyans. And you can see a marked difference between, in certain areas, between the first government, the first, his first term and his second term. But I also want to credit his second term, the coalition government, the grand coalition government, for bringing to birth the 2010 constitution, something that had been elusive for more than 20 years. That is one of the things that you credit the grand coalition government, which was President Kibaki and Right Honorable Raila Odinga. The, the men and women who are close to President Kibaki and I don't want to name names, right? Well, felt, ah, we have got what we wanted. So these other guys, it was very difficult for us in LDP. And we, I remember we sent Mzee Awori with Raila, uh, Raila and myself to go and now tell Mzee Kibaki, can we have the document read? Eh, the MOU read. And it had been sealed before Commissioner for Oaths at the Nairobi Club. And I had prayed over it. <laughs> so, the MOU was never read. That was the first major misstep. And that then brought a sense of mistrust within the political class. But fellows who are not appointed ministers started complaining that the MOU was not. Honored. The Katiba did not allow that formation of government. There was no support for, there was no constitutional support for what people thought they had agreed. And Kibaki as the president followed Katiba street. Because our team led by him failed, then it energized the other side to see that, look, the man in power has not been able to marshal people behind him and failing. So now it was a question of bombarding him. But in spite of that, he still steered the country until the new constitution. By then, I was no longer in with him, but the new constitution of 2010 was promulgated under his stewardship. For the time I was with the president, he told me and told me that if you bring in politicians in the consultations when you are appointing the cabinet, you never form a cabinet. Let them propose names. The work of appointment is mine. Because I know these people. So the politicians will bring proposals as to who they want him to appoint. But the first is competence. Are these people competent? Because you may want to appoint some, some people, but you get people who are not competent. Can you get a competent person Another one, because competence for him was very important. How competent are these people to deliver the program? The seeds of discord had now been sown, and the ill-fated 2007 general election now loomed ominously over a nation that only five years earlier had been rated as the most optimistic in the world. <laughs> The dusk swearing in of Mwai Kibaki for his second term and the ensuing meltdown in the country marked a new law for Kenya and for many critics remains an indelible blemish on Kibaki's legacy. I wouldn't call it a blemish, it was just political reality. And that's why when ODM Kenya, after the split of the oranges, and I was running for president, 
and garnered according to people, some of them say a distant third, <laughs> but let them try and get a million votes. <laughs> Because Kibaki had four million, I don't know, Raila had another, whatever. Um, when we decided to form the first coalition, before the grand coalition, that is what st stopped the bloodletting. Stopped the bloodletting because, of course, uh, President Kibaki uh, had been pronounced the winner, rightly or wrongly. The next thing is, if people are grieved, they'll go to the Supreme Court. Now that, I think, did not happen. So instead it was street fights. I asked the president, I told him, Your Excellency, because there is so much tension in the country, can I go and talk to the media, the, the chief media editors and the, and the owners, to tell them they have to, be, to handle this transition very, very responsibly. Because the way tensions are, you can very easily trigger violence. He told me go. He told me go and talk to them. I called a meeting at the Rambi house and they came. And I told them that we don't know what the results will be, but there is a lot of tension from which you are developing from both sides. So the way you handle this, this thing is very important. Whoever wins, it doesn't matter. But please handle it carefully. Don't explode the situation. You know, I got very interesting responses from the, some of the media chief editors. They said we, they were not children. I should not talk to them as though they were children. And I told them, I'm not talking to you as though you are, you are children, I mean, you are children. But this is a reality. We have a responsibility. You mean that you have a responsibility. We in government have a responsibility. So they said they know how to handle it. I left. And you know what happened after that? That was like around one o'clock. I went back to the president, I've talked to them, but they are not cooperating. That's what I do with the president. I told them, I told him they are not cooperating. He told, he told me, you know, India is like that. They like crisis. He told me, India like that. They like crisis. So, of course, that even, what did we find? The headlines. Stolen election from some of the newspapers. And after that, you know what followed. So it was very unfortunate. It was very unfortunate. But Kibaki, Kibaki was prepared even to step down. The tension was growing. The people were being mobilized in the town. And you know, Kibera, people were up in arms. When you were in that type of situation, if you, conti if you continue with, to operate within a vacuum, then things can get out of hand. So there was a Minister of Security, there was the Attorney General, there was the Minister of um, uh, Justice in the State House, there was Director of Intelligence and all that. And they discussed. And they found the best thing is not to allow a vacuum. So that will now empower those people who are, not, who are, who are complaining. The best thing is where the president. This is unprecedented in the history of Kenya, but is, since he has been announced, that period for swearing in is, uh, is administrative. Those who believed Kibaki did not win, and those who believed Raila had won, okay, that is an argument that can go on forever. But the reality was when ODM Kenya joined with Kibaki, the nation state was restored. Before Kofi Annan and other people came on board, 
uh, we didn't have a country. And so uh, I'm personally proud that my team uh, come up with that strong position that we need to save the country, which is what we did. We got names, we, 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 we were given bad names, but uh, no bad name can really compare to saving a whole nation. With so much at stake in Kenya, the international community mounted a spirited diplomatic offensive to pull Kenya back from the brink, giving rise to the much referenced Grand Coalition Government. But if the machetes and arrows had gone quiet, political intrigues were only just beginning. Kibaki had since picked the current Waipa leader Kalonzo Musioka as his vice president in the midst of the chaos. But now he had Raila Odinga as prime minister and a perceived co-equal in the running of government. There was a lot of complaints because, um, because the, the, the prime minister thought that he had the protocol of uh, the, the vice president. And we had to give the interpretation, which we even sent to parliament. And the parliament was satisfied. Because that protocol is in the, was in the, in the constitution itself. The prime minister had a sense of entitlement in terms of seniority or protocol. Eventually we resolved that. I myself decided I let the Prime Minister be the core leader. And since I'm on a Kibaki side, there's no point. The country is more important than us. And uh, those protocol things disappeared. Uh, you remember the ruling by Speaker Ken Marende about the leadership even of the House. Uh, we just postponed everything. But I ended up still being the, the leader of government business. And uh, in public, we would uh, make it easy. I took it upon myself to be introducing the president, the prime minister. So the pecking order for purposes of the real power sharing was the prime minister was uh, the number two, while legally the number two was the president, was the vice president. You know, the vice president, has more, has no power of his own. He is derived from the president. You know, it's like a waiting, a president in waiting. So a president in waiting, his protocol is still above the prime minister. Because even if Kibaki was out of office, then he's the vice president who would have taken over. Not the prime minister. The prime minister would not have taken over. And we had to, to be very clear on that because we never know what would happen. But there are other people felt that since the Prime Minister was, uh, was the, the partner in the government, he had a higher protocol. That time they were saying, had I joined with Raila or had I joined with Kibaki? But there was no basis of joining Raila. We had already split uh, the, the Orange Movement, okay? And here there are people saying, let us form a coalition. I don't regret one moment. If anything, I'm very proud that God used us to save this nation. Despite the shadow boxing and endless intrigues in the Grand Coalition, Kibaki in both of his terms is still considered to have been a president on time, especially for his passion to grow Kenya's economy. People remember him for free primary education, given access to all the children of Kenya to access education and even having a program going to fetch the children who would otherwise be left out. The biggest gift he has given to this country is Constitution 2010. Uh, itself a move, I think, from the center to the center left because it, it distresses the Constitution 2010, which is very strong on individual human rights, the Bill of Rights. Uh -huh. and, and the need to consider the, the welfare of the less fortunate. Therefore, the social safety nets that even Prime Minister Raila Odinga talks about. Um, so all of this, you can see, term it, uh, try and, 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 and term the total uh, legacy 
achievement of Mzee Kibaki as, as a complete statesman, a leader par excellence, and, and, and they never had selfish interest. When he took over in the year 2002, our growth was negative. And from a negative number, by the end of his first term, the growth of this, of this country's economy had gone to over 7% and was going towards double digit had we continued the same way. He is a man who literally gave his whole life for this country. He is a man whose first promise to Kenyans when he became president was no tolerance to corruption. Kenya has bid farewell to an icon, a man respected by friend and foe, and described by admirers as the father of modern Kenya. If I can tell you what I know is, Kibaki has never in his campaign asked people, will you elect me? Except one time I think he felt very pressed in his last campaign in 2007 when he asked somewhere in, in uh, Akur when he said, will you elect me? He always said, will you elect my group to reform Kenya? Good example is the superhighway because I went with the Mudaura as head of public service to convince him to accept that we name the superhighway. We thought a big achievement uh, for him. So when I presented the, uh, the matter before him of a cup of tea in his Arambe House office, he looked at me and said, uh, Vice President, uko hii barabara naenda kuna jina. That was the end of the discussion. I was just not Moike Baki's physician. He was my very good friend. And in this, I have lost a friend, a very dear friend, and a man who, as I say, is the founder of this country. This man is my, was my friend. My mentor. My boss. My almost everything that you can consider. I know him. He was a very selfless person. He had no undue ambition. Emilio Stanley Mwai Kibaki, third president of the Republic of Kenya. The longest serving member of parliament, an architect of Kenya's modern economy, the foxy politician, the gentleman, a man whose political story is as old as Kenya's, the end of an era. Ben Kitili, NTV.